Well, thank you. Let's give Bill and Judy a hand for putting this all together. Thank you, Lord, for Bill and Judy Cook. Well, I have um, a website, AmericanMinute.com, and I send out a daily history email uh, that you can sign up for. I also uh, have several books, and one of them that I just finished, and it's uh, up on Amazon. It's called Silence Equals Consent, The Sin of Omission. Speak now or forever hold your freedom. And um, a chapter in, the, you want to take a picture of it, a chapter in that book I go through Christian nationalism. Have you ever heard of that term? Did you know that nationalism is the opposite of globalism? And, uh, and there are globalists that want a one world government. And Klaus Schwab, uh, his Agenda 2030 video said, you will own nothing and be happy. It's a lot, sounds a lot like Karl Marx's where he said the theory of communism may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. You'll own nothing, abolition of private property. Okay, they want world communism. And, uh, but second, nationalism depends on the nation. In socialist nations, like the USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, there are no individual rights. The Nazi stands for National Socialist Workers' Party. There are no individual rights. Ask the Jews, right? But in America, our nation is guaranteed your individual rights from a creator. Freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom to defend yourself, freedom to a fair trial by a jury of your peers. They could use some of that in New York. Um, Freedom to to not have cruel and unusual punishment. They could use some of that for the uh, January 6th people. Uh, But in America, we're a nation guaranteed to rights from a creator given to you, and it's government from the consent of the governed. In other words, you get to be in charge. So in our nation, it's a good thing. We want to preserve our nation where we're in charge. Third, um, the the term... um, Christian nationalism, it used to be called Christian patriotism. And every president, Democrat, and Republican was in favor. So here is Washington. To the distinguished character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. Lincoln, intelligence, patriotism, Christianity, and a firm reliance on him who is are still competent to adjust in the best way all our present difficulty. Lincoln mentions patriotism and Christianity right next to each other in his inaugural address. And Theodore Roosevelt, he's a Republican. He's the first president to have a black man in the White House for dinner, Booker T. Washington. And the Democrats in the Deep South passed Jim Crow laws and black codes, and they were lynching blacks. Uh, Tuskegee Institute did a Research, they identified 4,400 documented lynchings. There were more than that, but those were documented. 1,200 of those were white Republicans down in the South registering the free blacks to vote. And so with this lynching going on, Teddy Roosevelt said, the mob lynches a Negro. Every Christian patriot in America needs to lift up his voice in loud and eternal protest against the mob spirit. Franklin Roosevelt, Democrat, passed out Gideon's New Testaments and Book of Psalms to all the soldiers in World War II. He wrote the foreword, As Commander-in-Chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces. And he says, Those forces hate democracy and Christianity as two phases of the same civilization. They oppose democracy because it is Christian. They oppose Christianity because it preaches democracy. Roosevelt The whole world is divided between pagan brutality and the Christian ideal. We choose human freedom, which is the Christian ideal. I wonder if the mainstream media would call him a a Christian nationalist, right? Um, And then Eisenhower. Any group that awakens all of us is a dedicated patriotic group that can well take the Bible in one hand, the flag in the other, and march ahead. Now, did you know that in um, 1965, 93% of Americans identified as Christian? 93% in 1965. There was 69% Protestant, 24% Catholic, and then 3% of the country was Jewish. Um, So America has always been patriotic with the majority Christian. Now, the left engages in something called psychological projection, where they blame you for what they're doing. It's in the Bible. 
Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of lusting after her when she was lusting after him. And so they want to establish a woke nationalism. They're pushing th- Satanist theocracy. They want transgender dominionism, right? They're the ones that are pushing an intolerant uh, belief system down the throats of everybody else, but they're wanting to accuse you of it. Well, Christians want to set up dominionism. It's like, no, we want freedomism, <laughs> right? Now, it's interesting that the um, same leftist globalists that are wanting to call Christians, Christian nationalists, they're funding LGBTQ activists. So here's an article, follow the money to the after party. Rockefeller's bankrolling of after party Bible study curriculum, which teaches Christians not to get involved, is red flag. It is the same grant round. In the same grant round is a group seeking to promote the leadership of the rural LGBTQ people. So here, Rockefellers and Soros's, they're giving money to LGBTQ activists telling them to get involved and giving money to to guilt trip and shame Christians not to get involved. What a brilliant strategy, right? And um, so now I want to go through history. There are two waves of pastors and churches that came to America, and they have two different views that are still affecting America today. So the... um, Do you know what the default setting for human government is? It's gangs. If we were to get rid of all police tomorrow, there'd be gangs. And a gang leader with enough weapons we call a king. Or a pharaoh or a Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar. The name changes, but it's one person in charge. And the first recorded instance of a gang leader, right, is Nimrod. So uh, Noah's Ark lands, Mount Ararat, down the Mesopotamian Valley, Tigris, Euphrates, you have the plains of Shinar, and you got Babylon, and you got Nimrod. Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is the first attempt at a one-world government, right? The population of the world is there, and Josephus, the Jewish commentator, said Nimrod wanted to build the tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. And he made everybody in town bake bricks and bring them, or he would kill them. So defiant against God, oppressive over man, God comes down, confuses the languages, and the people scatter into language groups that turn into nations. Nations were God's invention to postpone a one-world government. Take the population of the world, break them into subgroups, they'll sort of compete, cancel each other out. So no one, But every generation has some tyrant dictator that wants to conquer other nations. And if left unchecked, they'd have been happy to be the Antichrist. Yeah. Right? And so you go through Nimrod Tower of Babel, and then 2250 or 2500 BC is Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, and 2250 is Sargon of Akkadia, and 2000 years of Egyptian pharaohs, 5000 years of Chinese emperors, 700 BC, Assyria is the biggest empire. Now, these empires keep getting bigger because with military advancements, the kings can kill more people. So instead of Cain killing Abel with a rock, they can kill with a bronze weapon or an iron weapon or a phalanx spear or scimitar sword or gunpowder or directed energy weapon, right? (laughs) Um, But 700 BC, Assyria was the biggest empire. Nineveh was the capital. And they took the 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. Uh, Nineveh is captured by Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, which is captured by Persia, Cyrus of Persia. He's the one that lets the Jews go back and rebuild the temple. But Persia is conquered by Alexander the Great. He's got the biggest empire that the world had ever seen to this point. And then India has Chandra Gupta in the Mara Empire, controlling a quarter of the world's population. And then 25 BC, Augustus Caesar. Did you know he wanted to have a worldwide tracking system? It was called the census, a tax enrollment. If he could have had access to 5G and cell phones and facial recognition software, I bet he'd have been tempted to use that. And then an an Askamite empire in Africa, and then 450 AD, Attila the Hun. He had an army of a half million men, wiping out cities across Europe. He's coming toward Paris, and a woman named Genevieve gets all of Paris to fast and pray, and for some reason Attila skips sacking Paris. So Genevieve's called the patron saint of Paris. And then you have uh, 5th century, uh, the 6th, the Justinian of the Byzantine Empire, and then Islam, 7th century, conquers from the Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean. 
And then the, the Muslims are stopped from going into France by Charles Martel, his grandson is Charlemagne. He's got the biggest empire. They keep getting bigger. 1000 AD, the Vikings, boats with low keels. They go up every river in Europe. They've got the biggest empire. Then Genghis Khan in the 1200s. He kills 30 million people from Korea to Hungary. And um, you read the writings of the Christians, they would call him like the Antichrist. Certainly he had the spirit of Antichrist. And if he hadn't died, he'd have been happy to continue conquering. Kubla Khan, Tamerlane, he kills another 17 million. Ivan the Terrible of Russia. And then uh, across the Western Hemisphere, the same thing's happening. Aztec Montezuma. And they're taking captured tribes to the top of their pyramids and ripping their beating heart out to the sun god. Atahualpa in Inca Peru, power wants to concentrate into a gang leader. And then uh, the king of Spain had the biggest empire. And then the king of France and then the king of England and we broke away. But when, wherever there's a king, whatever the king believes, the kingdom has to believe. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? When I blow my trumpet, you bow to my statue. I don't care if you have a warm feeling in your heart for my statue. You bow or you're going to the fiery furnace. Kings want to tell you what to believe. It's, and if you don't, it's considered treason. And so something happens with the Reformation in 1517, where you have large percentage of countries not believing the way their king does. And so you have these different kingdoms and... Um, in 1555, they passed the Peace of Augsburg, where they say that, that whose realm his religion. So each uh, country has a king, and the king decides what's going to be believed in his country. So originally it was all Catholic, but now England is Anglican, Scotland is Presbyterian, Holland is Dutch Reformed, Northern Germany and Sweden are Lutheran, Switzerland Calvinists, and you know, Scotland Presbyterian, and they, uh, they didn't get along, they tar and feather each other, but, um, but you had the king deciding what's going to be believed in his kingdom, and if you don't believe the way your king did, you, you, you flee, so there's this mass migration of people across Europe. 1572, the king of Spain controls the Netherlands, and he does not like Dutch Reformed Protestants. And so Philip II sends the Iron Duke of Alba to Antwerp, Holland, and he kills 10,000 Dutch Reformed, leaves their bodies in the street. It's called the Spanish Fury. 1572 was a bad year. The same year, Catherine de' Medici, the Queen of France, she... Um, is faced with 10% of France being Protestant Huguenot. Now, at this time, there were Protestants killing Catholics and Catholics killing Protestants and Catholics killing Catholics, right? Spanish Catholics and French Catholics killing each other and Protestants killing Protestants. Anglican King of England killing Presbyterians. and, and uh, So a lot of killing going on. We don't want to go back and try to lame the blame, but we're trying to figure out where America came from. So here is Catherine de' Medici. She has a wedding of her daughter Margaret with the main Huguenot leader, Henry of Navarre. A couple of days after the wedding in Paris, she has her soldiers pull chains across the streets so carriages cannot ride out of town, and she sends her men house to house. They kill 30,000 of these Huguenot Protestants. It's called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And so you have people questioning what to do with Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authority, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. It's like, yeah, but what if the governing authority wants to kill your wife and kids? It's like, are you supposed to submit to that? Yeah, here they are. I found them the praying the wrong prayers, and you go ahead and kill them. And no, so people protested, and they were nicknamed protestants. <laughs> and uh, one of them was John Calvin. He says, we are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. It's sort of like Ephesians 6, children obey your parents. But what if there's a bad parent who tells their kid to sell themselves into prostitution and kill the neighbor? Is the child supposed to obey that parent? No, the child obeys the parent as long as the parent is telling them to do something that lines up with God's word. You obey the government as long as the government is telling you to do something that lines up with God's word. Why would God tell you to do something in his word and then tell you to submit to a government that tells you not to do what he just got done telling you to do? 
It's like Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham jail, 1963. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. So, these Calvinist Puritans came up with a way that we could rule ourselves without a king. It's pretty revolutionary. Because for all the world history, you have good kings, and then their son ends up being a bad king. Right? You got Solomon and his what? Son's Rehoboam? You know, I mean, you got and even David. And then he has a son, Amnon, who rapes his daughter, you know. Um, and so you have a good king with kids, they're bad kings, and they become tyrants. And, um, and so how do you, if you get rid of the, the bad king, it's chaos, and then everybody wants a good king to replace him, and you're just back to a king. It's just a circle, you know. Um, so this covenant form of government that they came up with is a way to, to break this cycle where you get rid of a king, but you, you hold it apart so it doesn't snap back with another king. And for this to work, everybody has to be educated about it. Everybody has to agree to it, and everybody has to participate in it. And now the timing of it was the Reformation and the printing press with Gutenberg. And so now everybody could have their own Bible. And so all the people in the church could now read the Bible. And, um, and so these covenant uh, Protestants looked back to ancient Israel as the model. And it's this triangle where you get blessings from God, you voluntarily share them with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. It's not socialism where the government takes away your stuff and redistributes it and you don't have any say. No, it's your stuff, but you feel a moral desire to want to help people, and you're doing it because you're doing it as unto God. Now, where did the pilgrims get this idea of a covenant form of government? The Bible. But what part of the Bible? That first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. It's called the Hebrew Republic. And it's the first time in recorded human history where you have millions of people and no king. Literally, I spent a couple years researching every single century of recorded human history. And you have Nimrods and Pharaohs and Caesars and Kaisers and Sultans and Tsars and Maharaja, Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, Attila, it's kings. They keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But one nation stands out unique, ancient Israel. 1400 BC, around there, they come out of Egypt, millions of them. And for four centuries, they have no king. And it works because everybody's taught the law. And everybody's personally accountable to God to follow it. This period in history is called the Hebrew Republic. And these Puritan scholars and these Calvinists, they were nicknamed Christian Hebraists. And uh, so, ancient Israel, everybody's taught the law. And everybody could read. That's one of the things I put in my books. Ancient Israel was the first literate population. There were 3,000 hieroglyphs in Egypt. And only the scribes could read them. It was their secret knowledge. Mesopotamia had 1,500 cuneiform characters. China had 10,000 characters. Trying to imagine teaching those to your kids. Moses comes down the mountain with the law in a 22-character alphabet. First letter's Aleph, second letter Beth. Sound familiar? So easy to learn. Kids could learn. Israel was the first literate population, so everybody knew the law. They could read it for themselves, and it was a, so. But the big question is, what would motivate you to follow an internal moral law? Israel had the key ingredient. There is a God who is watching everyone. He wants you to be fair, and He's going to hold you accountable in the future. So you're about to steal. Nobody's around. And then you think, God is watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable. Create something in your head called a conscience. (laughs) You hesitate. If everybody in the country believes this, you can maintain order with no king. You can get rid of the bad king, and you can keep order in society without it snapping back with another king. Kings rule through fear. But republics and democracies only work if there's morals and virtue. So Israel's system worked until the priests stopped teaching it. You say, what? Yeah, the priest stopped teaching the law. Here's Eli. His own sons are sleeping with women in the very tent where the Ark of the Covenant is. And then another Levite with a 
silver graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. The tribe of Dan comes along and steals the graven image and tells the Levite, come along with us. You can be a priest to our whole tribe. And you're reading the story, scratching your head, thinking, what's this Levite doing with the graven image? Isn't that like one of the commandments? You're not supposed to have them. And then there's the terrible story of a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite is to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is with the one he's not even married to. He's not following the law. And then they're traveling in a house surrounded by sodomites. Something about that behavior that appears at the last stages of a people ruling themselves. This casting off of self-restraint. The poor girl's raped to death. And by the time you're grossed out with that story, you read this line. Every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Why? Because the priest stopped teaching them what was right in the Lord's eyes. They lost the fear of God. They lost the knowledge of the law. All they had was their raw, selfish human passions. Turns into chaos. They all go to Samuel the prophet. And they say this self-government system's not working anymore. We want to be like all the other countries. We want a king. Samuel cries, and the Lord tells him, they did not reject you. They rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So, one story, King Saul rules as a tyrant. And he's pouting that his son Jonathan became friends with David. And he turns to his soldiers and says, none of you soldiers care about me. One soldier, Doeg the Edomite, says, King, I care. I saw David go to this town, and the priest gave him some bread and the sword of Goliath that was stored there. Saul said, that's all I need to know. Tell those priests to come to me. They show up. He turns to his soldiers and says, kill him. The soldiers hesitate. Doeg the Edomite says, I'll kill him, goes out there and kills them all. What just happened? The soldiers had been operating under the old system where each individual is accountable to God to follow the law. And the law says you need two or more witnesses before you condemn somebody to death. There's only one witness, this Doeg guy. So the soldier's like, okay, king, you're telling me to kill, and I'm accountable to God, and there's only one witness supposed to be two. They're hesitating. They have a conscience. Doeg, the Edomite, says, king, I'm going to surrender my conscience to the government, to you. You tell me to kill, I'll kill you. Tell me to kill the baby in the womb, I'll kill it. Tell me there's no more male and female, fine. Tell me you can go to any bathroom. Tell me there can be a fuzzy today. Whatever, I'm just a bunch of mush. Whatever, the, when you blow your trumpets, I'll bow to your statue. The government always wants to dictate beliefs to people, and God is jealous. He does not want the government between you and him. So why is this story important? Because the kings of Israel, England looked to the Bible for their authority, but they looked to the King Saul and on part of the Bible, the divine right of kings. The Calvinist Puritans and the Baptists and Presbyterians and Quakers that founded America, they looked to the pre-King Saul period of the Bible. 400 years, millions of people, no king, everybody's taught the law and everybody's personally accountable to God to follow the law. That's why they taught Hebrew at Yale and Harvard. So King Saul is the divider between America and England. Both of them are looking to the Bible, but you have a monarchy with kings rule through fear. You have a republic where the people rule themselves through morals and virtue. Os Guinness said covenantal ideas in England were the lost cause, but they became the winning cause in New England. Covenant-shaped constitutionalism. The American Constitution is a nationalized, secularized form of covenant. Covenant lies behind Constitution. And did you know the word federal is Latin for covenant? We have a covenant form of government in America where we, the people, rule government from the consent of the governed. We're not ruled by dictates and mandates from top down. Now, the King of England did not like the Baptists and Calvinists, Congregationalists and Puritans and Quakers, and he chased them out. And so 1630, you had the great Puritan migration. 20,000 Puritans are flooding into New England. And you have pastors and their covenant congregations setting up cities. 
And so you have a pastor, John Lothrop, in his little covenant church founding a city, Barnstable, Massachusetts, and another pastor, Reverend Roger Williams, and his church founded a city, Providence, Rhode Island, and the first Baptist church in America. You had a pastor, John Wheelwright, and his church founded a city, Exeter, New Hampshire, and a pastor, Reverend Thomas Hooker, and his church founded a city, Hartford, Connecticut, and the first Congregationalist church in America. This is unique on planet Earth. At this time, you have 5,000 years of Chinese emperors, Indian Maharaja, Raja means king, Maha means great. You have Muslim sultans, Russian czars, African chieftains, kings of Spain, France, and Austria. The whole world is kings. And this little greenhouse taking place in New England where you have pastors and their churches founding cities, a covenant form of government. And so let's look at Thomas Hooker. He founds Hartford. His church members come to him in 1638 and say, can you preach a sermon on how we're supposed to set up our government? So he gives a sermon titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid in the Free Consent of the People. This is reflected in our declaration, Government from the Consent of the Governed. And this is different from Europe because the kings of Europe did not ask the people for their consent. (laughs) Can you imagine the king of Spain? Hey, uh, people, can I please do this? No. So his sermon is written down. It's called The Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. And it is the Constitution of Connecticut from 1639 up until 1818. For nearly two centuries, Connecticut is using Pastor Thomas Hooker's sermon as their constitution. That's why they call themselves the Constitution State. Here's a plaque in England. Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Uh, Thomas Hooker's statue holding a Bible on the state capitol in Hartford. At the base, it says, leading his people through the wilderness, he founded Hartford. On this site, he preached the sermon, which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first written constitution that created a government. Another plaque, here ministered Thomas Hooker, a peerless leader in New England thought and life in both church and state. Another plaque, it says, Thomas Hooker, a leader, preacher, statesman who based all civil authority on the free consent of the people. They chiseled it in stone so we wouldn't forget it. This was a big deal. The people got to give their consent. And another plaque, it says, uh, near this site, May 31st, 1638, Thomas Hooker preached his famous sermon, The Foundation of Authority is Laid in the Free consent of the people and then representatives of the people adopt his sermon as the fundamental orders what do the fundamental orders say the people can join ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth so you have a church group conjoining itself into a public state All right, let me say that again a church group forming itself into a political group <laughs> now why did they do that to preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our lord jesus they wanted freedomism They wanted the freedom to believe with a conscience that was individually accountable to God without some king burning you at the stake and issuing mandates. Here's another plaque. It says, Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present Constitution of the United States is modeled. Do you grasp the significance of this? The Constitution is based on these colonial New England covenants that are based on the congregational church government where everybody's involved, which is drawn from the Reformation, which is drawn from the Bible, what part of the Bible that first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. We have, so the, there's a difference. So people that say, oh, you gotta submit to the king, right? But in America, it's a little bit different. So in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it's the pastors and their churches that created the state. How could you say, pastor, don't get involved in politics when it's the pastor's sermon that's their constitution? How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? There were like no non-church members to be lazy and let them run stuff. And so the word polis is Greek for city. Indianapolis, Minneapolis, and politics is simply the business of the city. And all there was in the city of Hartford was the church. And they had one building called a meeting house. That's where the pastor would teach the Bible. And that's where they would gather together and do their city business. The word synagogue means meeting house. 
That's where the rabbi would teach the law, and that's where they would gather together and do their city business. I mean, why build a separate building just to talk about a different topic? So when the revolution starts, the British send over a military governor, Thomas Gage, and he outlaws meeting houses. We don't need the people getting together and giving their consent to stuff. You just obey government mandates. And we're like, no, nothing happens in America unless we give our consent. And it's like, no, you obey government mandates. We're like, no, nothing happens in America unless we give our consent. He said, no, you're a robot, you're a zombie, you do what you're told. When the government issues a mandate, you blindly obey, you jump. And there's like, they said, no, we're in America, nothing happens unless we give our consent to it. It turns into a revolutionary war and we win. And we have a government where it's we, the people, and it's government from the consent of the governed. So Romans 13 is understood differently in a monarchy than in a republic. Kings have subjects who are subjected to their will. Did you know the word citizen is Greek? It means co-sovereign, co-ruler, co-king. So in a monarchy, subjects submit to the king. In a republic... The citizens are the king. The politicians are your servants. You hire them, you fire them, you vote them in, you vote them out. It would be silly for a king to have to obey his janitor. King, you can't go in this part of the castle anymore. It's off limits. It's like, who are you? I'm the janitor. It's like, where'd you come from? Oh, the cook and the butler hired me. Well, they're my servants, right? And and it's like the Supreme Court says you you can't do this anymore. It's like, who's the Supreme Court? Well, they're appointed by the president. I vote in the president. Well, they're confirmed by the Senate. Well, I vote in the Senate. So the justices are like servants of servants, right? And so we, the people, have been tell- saying, okay, well, we got to obey our servants. You know, No, you tell them what needs to happen. So this takes the authority of the believer to the next step, right? So subjects obey. Citizens give consent. Now, This is the 1600s. This is a Puritan covenant plan of government that was drawn from the Reformation, that was drawn from the Bible, that was drawn from the first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. It's a great plan. But after a century of the 1600s, it got a little dry, a little academic. And in Harvard and Yale, they would teach God has a plan, a plan for your life, your marriage, your family, your church, your government. Find out what the plan is, put it into place. Pretty simple. And, um, but some took it the next step and said, you know, God, in his infinite wisdom, already knows who's going to end up in heaven. So don't even bother preaching the gospel. It's just going to happen. Whoever's supposed to get saved is going to save it. And, and it got so dry that David Brainerd was expelled from Yale because he said his professor was as spiritual as a chair. And the Yale students got reprimanded in Connecticut because they were going into town and preaching the gospel on the streets and in pubs. And that was considered disrespectful. You have to wear the black robe and stand in the church and all the formalities, and you're preaching it on the street? And, um, and so in the 1700s, you had another movement of churches and pastors. It's called pietism. And they're nicknamed New Lights. So the Calvinists are now nicknamed Old Lights, and the Pietists are nicknamed New Lights. And they said, it's more than a plan. Christianity is more than a plan. You have to have a personal experience with Jesus. And when you do, your life will change. And you won't do worldly things you used to do. Like go to bars and brothels and loot theater and get involved in government. It's like, wait, what was that last thing? Yeah, government's filled full of worldly people. If you're really holy, you're not going to be involved in government. And so let's look at where these pietists came from. 1517, Martin Luther starts the Reformation because he had a personal experience that just shall live by faith. It was so personal, he was willing to stand up to the most powerful man on the planet, the king of Spain, and say, unless you can prove me wrong from Scripture, here I stand, so help me God. It was very personal to Martin Luther. But some German princes said, this is our chance. We've been wanting to break away from Rome. Kingdom of mine, I just decided you are all now Lutherans. And the people in the kingdom were like, okay, great, we're Lutheran. Uh, What do we believe? 
So for the people in the kingdoms, it's not the same personal experience Martin Luther had. It's a new state doctrine. And so a revival movement starts called pietism. That said, being a Christian is more than agreeing with state doctrine. Yeah, even if it's good doctrine, even if it's correct doctrine, you have to have an experience with Jesus. And when you do, your life will change and you won't do worldly things anymore, like go to bars and brothels and loot theater and get involved in government. <laughs> so where the Puritans, their key word is participation. Everybody participates in church. Everybody participates in the community. The pietist key word is withdrawal. You withdraw from the worldly things. And so it turned into the German concept of the two kingdoms. The kingdom of the government, the kingdom of the church, the two don't touch. And uh, so the Puritans... The individual can be involved in both church stuff and state stuff. Did you know you can do two things? You can be a spouse and you can be a parent. Two completely different roles, but one person can do both. You can be involved in church stuff and you can be involved in state stuff. You can do both. But the pietists are like, no, no, no. You have to withdraw from worldly things like being involved in government. And so I have a question. If the more spiritual people withdraw from politics, who is left to be involved but the less spiritual? (laughs) It's like, hello, what do you expect them to do? Yield to their selfish ambition and end up becoming tyrants? And so there were actually German princes that donated money to the pietists so they would teach their people not to get involved in the prince's business. Here's some more money to stay out of my hair. Right? It's like the, the Rockefellers and the George Soroses giving money to the after-party Bible study curriculum. Don't get involved in politics so that we can get our activists to do everything. Right? And so four centuries of that teaching in Germany allowed Hitler to put Jews on train cars. And they're going right past the church crying out for help. And the church's response was, well, that's the government doing that, and we're the church, and we can't get involved in government stuff, so let's just sing praise songs to Jesus louder. Can anybody see there's something wrong with that picture? Now, um, we have to give credit where credit's due. The pietists did emphasize a personal experience with Jesus. And these Moravians from Germany, they went to Iceland and Egypt and India and all around the world, and these were young people. Imagine all the woke energy that young people have. Instead of tearing stuff down and burning stuff, they're risking their lives to go to foreign countries, and they're not getting checks in the mail. This was a movement where they would work three jobs, and on the side they would preach the gospel. And uh, so some of them were going to Georgia to minister to the Indians, and they were called... Moravians, because they were from this little kingdom in Germany called Moravia that borders the Czech Republic. And uh, so these Moravian German Lutheran pietists are on a boat going to Georgia, and on the boat are the Wesleys. And there's a storm. And John Wesley said, the sails were ripped to shreds and the waves came in and we thought the sea had swallowed us up. And the Wesleys are running through this boat and the water's coming in and they get into the area where the Moravians are. And they're just singing praise songs to Jesus. And afterwards, John Wesley says, was you not afraid? And they said, no, we were not afraid. Well, was not your wives and children afraid? No, we were not afraid. We belong to Jesus. Wherever he wants us, here or in heaven, you know, it's like, and John Wesley's like, "Uh, you have a personal experience with Jesus that I don't have. Wesley sort of fail in Georgia, go back to England. They meet another Moravian, Peter Bowler, who invites him to a prayer meeting at Aldersgate. And uh, John Wesley said, I went very unwillingly to a society meeting in Aldersgate where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. And about a quarter before nine, as he was describing the change that God works in the hearts of those who have faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And he gave me an assurance that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John Wesley had an experience with Jesus. He goes over to Moravia and he lives with the Moravians for eight months. Describes it as the religion of the heart. You're believing stuff not because the government's going to burn you at the stake and, and they didn't always agree. And so the Moravians had a prayer meeting because they didn't agree with each other. They were starting a little uh, tension and 
um, Ludwig von Zinzendorf, their leader, they have a communion service, and they pray all night, all day, all night, and then they uh, pray all week, and they take turns with the kids and the farm and the food, and they pray all month, all, all year. That prayer meeting went on uninterrupted for over 100 years. And these Moravians are sending missionaries out all around the world. And anyway, so the Wesleys get their friend involved, George Whitfield, and he preaches up and down the colonies seven times, starts this great awakening revival. And uh, it's wonderful. People are coming to the Lord. It's not just a uh, doctrine. It's not just a plan. They're having a personal experience with Jesus. But the byproduct is they're going to withdraw. And... Uh, the founder of the Lutheran Church in America was uh, Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf. I mean, excuse me, a, a friend of Zinzendorf. His name was Henry Muhlenberg. And he had two sons. And uh, Bill Cook's going to tell you about them in a little bit. But um, uh, the, th- the thought is, why can't there be a middle of the road? Why can't we have a covenant plan of government where we, we can rule ourselves without a king and have it be a personal experience with Jesus? I mean, why can't we have both? I mean, it is a personal experience with Jesus. We've all been there. Thank God that God cares about each of us as a person. But don't we want to leave a country to our kids where they get a chance to have a personal experience with Jesus? Because if you don't get involved, what they are teaching the children is there is no God. And they're teaching them that if God does exist, he is messed up. He's putting men in women's bodies, and you have to have operation to fix it. He's either confused and making mistakes, or he's powerless, or worse yet, he's sadistic. And if that behavior is not sin, what? Sex outside of marriage. You know all those little library books where they teach him all the different kinds of sex that they can try? If sex outside of marriage is not sin, arguably, there are no sins. And if there's no sins, you certainly don't need a savior to save you from your sins. And so while spiritual people, we don't want to get involved in politics, we're just going to enjoy our personal relationship with Jesus. It's like, yeah, you're letting the gospel of antichrist be taught to your kids. And so um, the most important thing is to bring people to Christ. The second most important thing is to preserve the freedom to do the most important thing. If you really believe the gospel is the answer, you're going to be involved wanting to preserve the freedom to preach the gospel. Now, to those that think it's holier not to be involved. Don't want to be involved in politics. It's dirty. I'm just going to, we just preach the gospel at our church. We just focus on, on Jesus and loving Jesus, and we don't get involved in all the worldly stuff. I have a question for those type of people. What do you do with Numbers chapter 30? It's the silence equals consent chapter of the Bible. A half a dozen scenarios. One, if a daughter binds herself with a vow while living in her father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow and holds his peace, then all her vows shall stand. But if her father overrules her on the day that he hears, then none of her vows shall stand, and the Lord will release her. That's come down to us as vows in a wedding ceremony. And the pastor tells the church members, If you are silent when you hear these vows, you are giving consent to the vows, right? Book of Common Prayer. If anyone present knows any reason, this couple should not be joined together in holy matrimony. Speak now or forever hold your peace. If you are holding your peace and you are silent, you are giving consent to the vows. It's called the rule of tacit admission, T-A-C-I-T. Black's Law Dictionary. An admission reasonably inferable from a party's failure to act or speak. And uh, it's in debt collection law. Somebody owes you money, and you wait 10 years to try to collect. The judge will say, well, you're past the statute of limitations. If you really thought they owed you money, you would not have been silent for so long. It's in trademark law. You design a trademark. Somebody copies it, and they're using it. And, you, and if you don't try to defend your copyright, the judge will say, well, you knew about it. You didn't say anything. You must have been given your approval. They get to use it. It's in real estate law. If you have a piece of property and somebody's squatting in it, and you don't try to evict them or charge them rent, they can gain title to your property through adverse possession just by you being silent. It's in our Constitution. Article 1, Section 7. Congress passes a bill, puts it on the president's desk. 
If any bill shall not be returned by the president within 10 days, the same shall be a law in like manner as if he had signed it. All he has to do is be silent for 10 days and it equals his signature. Silence equals consent. And so if church members, silence gives consent to wedding vows, <clears throat> it gives consent to other things. Yeah. And if they are killing babies in the community and the church members know about it and they are silent, they're giving consent to killing babies. Yeah. And if you give consent to sin, you become an accessory to it and you'll share in the judgment. Leviticus 20. Any Israelite who sacrifices any of his children to Molech is to be put to death if the members of the community close their eyes. When that man sacrifices one of his children to Molech, I myself will set my face against him and his family and will cut them off from their people together. All you have to do is close your eyes when they kill the kid and you're cut off. You know, I was in California last year. They actually had a bill to kill babies 28 days after birth. And enough pastors, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, they went down to Sacramento and they said, we cannot be silent and force them to change the wording of that. <clears throat> Acts 22, Paul's talking to the Lord. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. Paul did not throw a stone. Paul did not say a word, yet he knew he was guilty for the death of Stephen just by being silent. Proverbs 24, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to death. Don't stand back and let them die. Don't try to disclaim responsibility by saying you didn't know about it. For God who knows all hearts knows yours, and he knows you knew, and he will repay everyone according to his deeds. Mordecai tells Esther, there's a mandate from the government to kill the Jews. If you remain silent at this time, deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Numbers 20, Moses and Aaron are called to the door of the tabernacle. The Lord spake to Moses, take the rod, gather the assembly, thou and Aaron, speak to the rock, and it shall give forth water. Well, they gathered the assembly, and Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and water came out abundantly. End of the chapter. The Lord spake to Moses, Aaron will not enter the land because both of you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. It's like, both? We just read the chapter. Aaron did not do anything. Aaron did not say a word. Yeah, that's just it. Aaron was at the door of the tabernacle. He heard God say, speak to the rock. When Moses lifted up the rod and hit the rock the first time, it probably took Aaron by surprise. When Moses lifted up the rod the second time, Aaron knew what was coming, and he did not protest. He didn't say, well, Moses, hold it, hold it. I was there at the door. I heard, I heard God say, speak to the rock. No, he was silent, and in that instant, Aaron was guilty. Moses's was a sin of commission. Aaron's was a sin of omission. Leviticus 5, a person sins because he did not speak up, even though he was an eyewitness to a case or knew what happened. Anyone who failed to testify is guilty. Martin Luther King Jr., he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetuate it. He who accepts evil without protesting it is really cooperating with it. We all know this verse, Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know the verse right before it? Confront your neighbor directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. <laughs> they're loving each other, loving each other, and they're confronting each other. Right? One translation says, rebuke your neighbor directly and you will not incur guilt because of him. Proverbs 9, rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Ecclesiastes 7, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than the song of fools. Luke 17, New Testament, if your brother sin, rebuke him. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke. Now you can do it nicely. 1 Timothy 5, 1, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and younger men as brethren. What does entreat mean? It doesn't mean being silent. It means you petition respectfully. 
You're not silent, though. So they have a woke tactic, and it's to guilt trip Christians into being more Christian than Christ. They say, if you're really a Christian, you will be silent while we teach your children something that Jesus would never teach your children. So if you're really Christian, you won't act like Christ. Would Jesus teach the trans agenda? We know what Jesus taught. Matthew 19, he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. These precious little boys and girls made in the image of God. I mean, think of it. Here are school counselors that cannot even define a woman. Think they can tell a little boy he's supposed to be a little girl? It's like you can't even define girl. How do you know you're supposed to be one? It's insanity. And church members are silent giving their approval. Jesus warned, if you cause one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, better than a millstone be put around your neck and you be thrown in the depths of the sea. So it is going to be a rude awakening for all those church members who think they're being spiritual. Oh, we're just going to focus on the gospel. We just we don't get involved in politics. We're just going to withdraw. It's going to be a rude awakening when they realize that they are being silent. They're giving their approval to all the wickedness going on. They're inviting the judgment of God on their heads. Now, a scriptural case can be made that God cares about children. And so the answer is local, local, local. Do you know there's more people that go to church in an area than vote in school board races? You know, I was with um, George Barnum, and he was saying how the areas that have the highest percentage of Christians have the lowest voter turnout. Because the churches have bought into, oh, we're being holy, we're being holy. And then the, the left is more than happy to encourage them. Yeah, yeah, be, be holier. <laughs> yeah. well, we're experts on the Bible, even though we're not Christian, but we're experts, and you're not supposed to be involved. We get, you get out, and we're going to give money to our activists to get them involved. So more people go to church in an area than vote in a school board race. So it's like, look, we don't agree with every church on every doctrine, but none of us are happy with what's going on in the public schools. Let's just get behind some mama bear and vote her in. And then show up at the school board meeting early and pack it out so they don't go busting people in and beat up on her. And um, if churches can just care about children in their neighborhood. If they can just care about the children in their neighborhood, I'm convinced all the higher races will take care of themselves. Once the people learn how, well, this is how it works. Oh, gee, you knock on some doors and you collect some names. and All they need is the blessing of the pastor that it's okay to be involved. And there's groups now. There's Turning Point Faith And I work with them, and they help the churches because pastor has so many things on their plate. They don't need another thing. And there's Salt and Light Council with Dran Reese. And all the pastor has to do is pick somebody. And they can pick the person they trust and say, you be in touch with this group, Salt and Light Council, Turning Point Faith, or other ones. And, um, And they have the Zoom calls, and they do all the training. Well, this is the deadline to register people, and this is how you do. And and all the pastor has to do is, okay, announcement time. We got vacation Bible school, and we got the, you know, the the senior outreach, and uh, community involvement go over to Mary's table in the lobby. That's all he has to do. And we can begin to turn this thing around. You know, an observation from studying history as power concentrates into fewer and fewer hands globally, God's counterbalance is to get more and more people involved locally. We all see power concentrating. George Soros, Klaus Schwab, you know, BlackRock, State Street, we, we see power concentrating into fewer and fewer hands globally. God's counterbalance is to get more and more people involved locally. You know, I think God wants to have an end time revival, but I don't think it's going to be done with a couple big name preachers. I think it's going to be the body of Christ, everybody participating, everybody getting involved, wherever their gift is, where their talent is, and get involved in every area like yeast. And um, here's a thought. Maybe God is letting the evil be exposed to expose the condition of our hearts. I mean, how much will you stomach? How much will you put up with? What will it get you to do something? I mean, if you're not going to play a good offense, at least play a good defense. If the body of Christ is not taking seriously winning the world for Christ, at least don't keep your mouth shut when they're doing evil. 
I mean, these are stories every day in the news. Here's one. Male student who identifies as transgender injures three girls during a basketball game, causing opposing team to forfeit. Here's one. Male field hockey player on a female high school team knocks out girls' teeth mid-game. I mean, it's insanity that's going on. Now, some people are remaining silent, doing nothing, just waiting for Jesus to come and rescue them out of this mess. It's getting really bad. Oh, just Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming. Looking forward to it. Oh, it's just getting bad. I have a question for you. Who do you think you're going to meet when you're raptured? Uh, Jesus. Do you think Jesus loves the little children? Oh, yes. Do you think he might wonder why you didn't do anything to protect them? I mean, we're not in China or North Korea where you don't vote. We're in America where the citizen is the king. You're in charge. And even if we can't turn it around, shouldn't we at least try? Now, Let's try this one. Hello, test. I guess the Lord wanted to let that point sink in there. So what does our silence say about the condition of our hearts? Jesus said in the last days, because evil will abound, the love of many will wax cold. Ezekiel 9, the Lord gives him a vision. He cried, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Behold, six men came, every man with a destroying weapon in his hand. He called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And, and the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city. Put a mark on the foreheads of those who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said, go after him through the city. Slay old and young, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. What's the difference between being slain and not? Does your heart sigh and cry over the abominations in the city, in your city? Now, I would venture to say that you, being here at Moravian Falls on a Saturday, your heart sighs and cries over what's happening, what's happening to the children, what's happening in your community. You're part of those with a mark on your forehead. There's a song... And uh, Kim Walker Smith is a praise and worship leader, and she has a, a YouTube video of her singing the song with a little children's choir in the background. And, uh, and it's Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And there's a line in the song that says, Break my heart for what breaks yours, everything I am for the kingdom's cause. And I thought that's an interesting line to put in a song. Break my heart for what? Do you think it breaks Jesus' heart to have these little innocent children being mutilated? You know, Jim Caviezel did the movie Sound of Freedom about sex trafficking of little children. And a lot of it takes place in America. I was in Colorado last month, and they had a bill. Colorado Representative Scott Bottoms confirms that people are buying one- to five-year-old children for sex. And he put through a bill for a minimum punishment for people caught buying little children for sex. Every Democrat voted against it. Yeah. Proverbs 13. And churches are silent. Oh, we don't want to get involved. We don't want to get involved. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, Jesus did not pet lambs all day long. His first sermon ended with them wanting to push him off a cliff. Another sermon ended with them picking up stones to stone him. Another sermon ended with them saying, this is a difficult saying, who can bear it? And they stood up and walked out of church. <laughs> right? They walked with him no more. Jesus didn't run after him and say, oh, you misunderstood me. He turns to the 12, says, you want to go too? There's the door. And Peter said, where else can I go? You're the only one with the words of eternal life. Jesus was invited to dinner. And the Pharisee noticed that Jesus did not wash his hands. And Jesus said, you Pharisees are more concerned about the outside of the cup and not the inside. You're like a sepulcher, pretty on the outside, inside full of dead men's bones. And the lawyer says, well, Jesus, by saying that, you're insulting us lawyers. 
He said, let me tell you about you lawyers. You heap burdens on people too heavy to carry. Don't even lift a finger yourself. You hold the keys of knowledge. You don't go in and you don't let anybody else in. And he, he lays it on to them. And then the chapter ends. And you wonder if they ever got around to eating dinner. <laughs> you sort of get the feeling you pushed them out on the street. This is our loving Jesus. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. To the prideful people, our Jesus was tough as nails. To the humble, he was as loving as can be. It's like magnets, right? If they stuck together, but if one of them turns, they're not going to touch. When we're humble, we're, we're connected with God. When we're pride, pride's the sin of Satan. You know, there's a verse that says, He who falls on the stone will be broken, but on him on whom it falls will be crushed. What does that mean? That means if you voluntarily be broken, you voluntarily confess, I'm a sinner, I've blown it, I need help, and you trust in the blood of Jesus to cleanse you of your sins, like, thank you, Lord, right? You receive God's grace. But if you're prideful, guess what? You're going to face the tough side of God. And um, now, if pastors tone down their preaching because they don't want to get a negative response, guess what? You're going to be toning it down so you won't get a positive response. Every crowd Jesus preached to were humble people receiving, getting saved and healed, and prideful people wanting to catch him in his words so they could go out and kill him. The same thing happened with Peter. He's coming into the temple. Silver and gold have I none. What I have give I thee. And the guy jumps up, leaps, and praises God. And the Sanhedrin says, we've got to arrest him and put him in jail. The apostle Paul comes into a town. People are healed and saved. And then the other ones want to stone him to death. If Jesus is in us, when we come into an area, wouldn't you expect the same type of response? And if we're so afraid of having people get up and leave, you're not going to be preaching with conviction that's going to reach the people that need to get saved. Now, Peter, uh, Jesus asked the apostles, who do men say that I am? And some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah. And then, of course, Peter said, thou art the Christ. But let's look at it. Who was John the Baptist? He stood up to the corrupt leader, King Herod. Who was Elijah? He stood up to the corrupt leader, King Ahab and Jezebel. Who was Jeremiah? He stood up to the corrupt King Zedekiah. And they're mistaking Jesus for him? Now, we're social creatures. We want to be accepted. We do not want to be rejected. Uh, that's the concept that they use um, worldwide. It's called honor-shame culture. Most cultures, your worth as a person is if your group honors you and your worth goes down if you're shamed or kicked out. In Islam, they call it the Ummah, the community. In Islam, I mean, in India, they have the caste system and your identity is with a group. And, of course, in communist countries, if you're members of the CCP, right, your worth is dependent. And now they're calling the, the intersectionality, how many minority groups you can belong to, your worth goes up, right? But we're social creatures. We want to be accepted. We don't want to be rejected. Peter's with a group around a fire. And he is about to be rejected. A girl gets in his face and says, you are with Jesus and you can, you can just picture Peter looking around the fire, and everybody's eyeing him. And he realizes he's about to get kicked out of the group. And he says, um, I never met the guy. Like, that's it, Peter? You caved? So you were with him a couple hours ago, and he caved? But after the resurrection, Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Sanhedrin said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. And Peter replied, we must obey God rather than men. Suddenly, Peter does not care about being kicked out of a group. He doesn't care what people say about him. All he cares about is God. I had a thought. I mean, what's, what, what happened? Jesus had risen from the dead and was with him for 40 days, but Peter was still hiding out. What happened? It was the day of Pentecost. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. I had this thought. Maybe one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is having the courage to stand up to corrupt government. Jeremiah, be not afraid of their faces, the Lord told him. Exodus 20, neither shall you follow the multitude in doing evil. Why? So there's a whole lot of people that are going to be doing evil, and God wants you to be the stick in the mud. Uh, another translation, don't do something just because everybody else is doing it. If you see a group of people doing wrong, don't join them. You must not let them persuade you. And um, 
Some people say, well, I'm not going to do anything, but God knows my heart. He knew Abraham's heart, but he still wanted to see Abraham be willing to go to the top of Mount Moriah and offer up his son. I mean, imagine a guy watching football and you ask him, when was the last time you told your wife you love her? He's like, uh, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, okay. Uh, when was the last time you did anything to show your wife you love her? Uh, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, dude, we need to have a little marriage counseling here. <laughs> People say, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. And he wants to hear some words out of your mouth and see some actions. You know, we're the bride of Christ, and every romance novel builds up to a decision-making moment, a forsaking of all others and choosing the one. I think God is intentionally pushing the world to a decision-making moment. And some people are going to choose the all others. They're going to want to be liked and friended and followed by a group so much that they'll, I'm a, they're afraid to be put out of the synagogue because they love the praises of men more than the praises of God. And, but I think God is pushing the world to a decision-making moment, and he's letting the evil be exposed. I mean, think of it. I, never in my lifetime, I'm 66, you have Satan uh, after-school clubs on elementary school campuses. And Disney coming out with a uh, little demon FX cartoon. Danny DeVito was the voice of Satan, right? And um, you have Satanism at uh, the, the Grammys, and Target partnering with a Satanist brand clothes designers and Satan statues in the Iowa State Capitol. Hello, it's like the Wizard of Oz, and uh, God's pulling back the curtain, and you see this old man there, you right? God's like, okay, no more hiding. We got Satan, and at the same time, God is exposing the boldness of the Holy Spirit-filled Christians, and God's like, okay, we're getting close to the end of the romance novel. You need to make your choice, God, devil. Gonna make it really easy, God, devil. We're gonna expose Satan, right? And you can, and uh, and some people are doing evil, and some people are silent in the face of evil. And by their silence, they're giving consent to it. They're siding with it. And there are others of us that say, you know what? I was silent, and I tolerated something I didn't feel good about, and then I stretched the rubber band and tolerated something else I didn't feel good about. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry I can't go with hysterectomies on little eight-year-old girls because they went through a tomboy phase. I'm sorry I can't go with castrating a little boy because he picked up his sister's doll, and you cut the rubber band, and it splits. You know, someday you're going to be dead. It's a nice way to end my talk. And, uh, and you're going to be in heaven because you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing his praise than when we just begun, imagine you have been in heaven for 10,000 years, and you're walking the streets of gold, and you meet Moses. That'd be pretty neat. Maybe Moses will invite you over to his place. I don't know what it's like in heaven, but I bet Moses will have a pretty nice place. He'll probably have one of those big fireplaces where the logs don't burn up. Get at the burning bush in the wilderness, didn't burn up, and the logs in his fireplace. I heard one preacher say, in heaven, you'll travel as fast as you think. And I'll probably show up late. <laughs> My wife will say, where were you? I'll say, oh, I was thinking about something else. But imagine we all get there, and maybe Moses has a big living room, maybe the size of this room, and he's sitting right in front of you. And after the small talk's over, you tap him on the shoulder, say, Moses, tell us a story. I read the book. I, I even saw the movie. But here you are in person. And the room will get quiet. He'll stand up and he'll say, it looked bad. The government was after us. The Pharaoh, the most powerful military leader in the world with chariots and swords, and we were totally unarmed. It looked totally hopeless. And I just stood there in faith holding up my staff. I said, God, use me to deliver your people. And the waves came in and swallowed up Pharaoh's chariots. We're going to say, wow. We'll probably see it in a 3D. And then we're going to look... And sitting next to you is David. Say, David, tell us your story. And he'll say, it looked really bad. The government, this Goliath, they were going to kill us, and all the grown-ups were too chicken and scared. And I said, enough of that. I took my little sling. I went out there and hit him in the head, took his own sword, and chopped his head off. 
and then Gideon and Esther and Deborah and the Apostle Paul. Every, it's going to be really exciting. And then everyone in the room is going to look at you. Say, you, we haven't heard you yet. Tell us your story. What did you do when it was your turn to be down there on earth? What were they saying about God in your country? Or the baby that the Lord knew in the mother's womb like Jeremiah? Or marriage that God instituted. The man shall leave the father and mother, cleave to the wife, the two shall become one. Or, or sex when God made them male and female. What did you do when the whole world was against you and it looked hopeless and they're all sitting on the edge of their seats and waiting for you to talk? What are you going to say? You know, I'd hate for any of us to be up there and Jesus walk in the room and then point to a big screen and you see all these people coming to the Lord, miracles, and him saying, well, this is what I had planned for you to do down on earth, but you just didn't have enough faith and courage. And you look back at your life, and that big mountain that held you back is a little anthill. It's a little fear of man. What are people going to say about me? Could you imagine being with the Apostle Paul, and he talks about being stoned and left for dead, and, and you're like, yeah, but did they post anything bad about you on Facebook? So we're going to be up there. And Jesus, he's like the, the coach, and you're like the basketball player, and you're on the bench, and he comes over to you, and he says, it's your turn, get in the game. And you're like, but coach, they're playing really tough out there. And he goes, yeah, I know, uh, it's your turn, get in the game. And you're like, but coach, somebody just got knocked down. He's like, yeah, you're seven feet tall, they are four feet tall, you can do this. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against him. Though a thousand fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, it shall not come nigh you. Out of all the world's history, the good Lord decided for you to be alive right now. He knows every globalist, dirty backroom deal. He knows all that. He's given you his word. He's given you his spirit. He's given you great Christian friends. This is your time to write your chapter and do all those great things that you will be known for for eternity. God bless you.